Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Dawn Tura, I'm President and CEO of Sourcing Industry Group, also known as SIG, and I want to welcome you to today's webinar. There are a few things I'd like to go over with you before we get into the, the meat of the conversation as to why you're here today. About SIG, SIG is 100% non-commercial in nature. We are about networking and sharing best practices. And these are some of the events that, this is a little bit about SIG, some of the events that we do, some of the resources we have. But I really want to tell you to get into the SIG Resource Center. If you have not been in there lately, it's been completely and totally redone. And it has the best search engine and it's screaming fast and it's just constantly being populated with things that you really need to, to do your job better. Everything from tools and templates, methodologies, RFPs, RFIs, categories that are completely built out for you. So make sure you get into the new SIG Resource Center. Our SIG Global Summit is coming up again, and it's going to be October 9th through 12th, and it's in Carlsbad, California. Some of the brands down below, I know you recognize them, but more importantly, we want to recognize you and have you be part of this incredible networking event. It starts on Monday with a scramble golf tournament. Then we go into some workshops and working council meetings. And then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we keep you together from 6 a.m. with a beach run, excuse me, with a, 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 a run or yoga. And we end about 10 o'clock at night, and you will come home with a pocket full of cards of people that are just going to increase your networking capabilities. And they're your, they're your go-to people in between summits, along with the rest of SIG. Also, we're taking SIG all over the globe. So our upcoming signature events, we have August 31st in Sydney, Australia, October 26th, Toronto, Canada, and our CPO Meet and Eat Toronto, Canada. Now, of course, we are doing our CPO Meet and Eat programs all around the United States as well. I just had a fantastic event in Chicago last week. I've got Minneapolis in two weeks. We've got uh, New York coming up again, San Francisco, Seattle. So please join us at one of these CPO Meet and Me. SIG University, I'm really excited, but our next semester launch is June 26th. And we are going to be launching not only the Certified Sourcing Professional course, but also the Certified Supply Management Professional course as well. This is the inaugural launch for the Certified Supply Management Professional, and it will take you through governance and then risk and compliance, all the things that you need to do. If you're great at sourcing, you still have to be great at governing that contract once it's in place and managing that supplier relationship. So please join us. I, we have usually a couple hundred people at each start. We keep you in cohorts of about 25 people so you can get to know all your fellow students. So I'd love to have you join us. It has just been met with amazing success. We have people certified by the end of this year, probably over 1,000 people. Already we have people certified in nine different countries. So please join us at SIG University. And then SIG launched our individual membership program. Now that's not the right thing for most of you, but if some of you are professionals and you just can't get your company to understand the value of SIG, you can get an individual membership. And while that doesn't allow you to necessarily present at a summit, it does give you the ability to get discounted summit seats. You get a discount on SIG University certification. You can attend and download our peer-to-peer -peer access, our webinars, our signature event attendance. You can be in our LinkedIn group as well. So a lot of benefits for you. Obviously, we'd love to have your entire organization, the entire enterprise as a member. But if that just doesn't work for your enterprise, we'd love to have you in the individual membership program. So now, before we jump in today, sourcing in a tight labor market, I wanted to tell you a few things. The lower right-hand corner of your screen, you should see Q&A. If you click on that and open it up, I would love for you to send in any questions that you have during the presentation, especially if we mention an acronym or something you don't understand, or you just really want to learn more. So if we don't get to all of your questions today, I've been assured by our amazing presenter, John Moore, that he will follow up with you after today. So keep the questions coming, and rest assured you will get an answer. And if we can't do it by the top of the hour, we will follow up with you. Also, as a member of SIG, you'll know that this is being recorded. We'll send out a link tomorrow, tomorrow to all of you, along with a digital copy of today's deck. We just want you to know that that's available for you to send out that link for the next two to three years, depending on how, how people fluent wants us to keep it up. But you can share that link, and it's available for download and replay. And a lot of people, after they see a, pre a presentation or a webinar like today, or they might have to leave early, they send it out to a lot of other colleagues, and we get a lot more viewership after that. John's contact information is included in the last page of our deck. It will also be included in the email that we will send to you tomorrow so you can follow up with our presenter. And then also we will push the slide deck to you today at the end of the webinar as well. So please join us by making this interactive. 
um, we want to, you know, your, your Q&A sort of lets us know how you're thinking about the topic. So with no further ado, what I'd love to do now is, is hand it over and introduce you to John Moore. So many of you probably recognize John, but he is a senior consultant with People Fluent and is a specialist in contingent management processes and tools. He managed an international division of a staffing supplier. He's worked as a process consultant with a BMS software company, and he served as a director of an advisory service with a global management services provider. Now, as a senior manager of PricewaterhouseCoopers, he also implemented the first SaaS VMS solution and managed an internal vendor management team. He's also a certified contingent workforce professional. So, John, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Don. Thank you for that introduction. Happy to be here again. And um, as Don said, what I'm going to talk about uh, is what really is, makes a tight labor market what sourcing options are out there, the old and the new, and then about building your own sourcing ecosystem. So before I do that, a quick one-page commercial here about People Fluent, my company of where I'm from. This company has been around for over 18 years, uh, privately owned. It's currently serving about 80% of the Fortune 1000. What we offer is talent acquisition and talent management solutions. Uh, in all of the different areas you may look at as compensation, compliance, diversity, uh, recruiting, uh, various uh, other, uh, about 16 different products overall. Covers the entire world, really 196 countries, 5,200 different customers, and it's all scalable and secure SaaS models. So what I want to get into is talking about the tight labor market, and really when you look at a tight labor market, when you have a low unemployment rate, that's where it causes some issues. Now, 5% is considered the norm, really. You never really get down to zero. Uh, somebody's always out looking for new work and, and new jobs. But we're slightly below 5% right now. And that's, that 5% is more than just a number. It creates some issues. Uh, the effects of low import, uh, unemployment can mean more demand for skilled workers, which is driving wages higher. It's also that higher available wages can cause job hopping, which again drives wa wages up. So low unemployment along with, along with the fact that you can blame it on the baby boomers, about 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day. That's once they were the largest workforce, about 79 million of them back in 1999, but they're retiring at a rate of about 4 million per year. That 4 million per year means it's 4 million skilled workers. And the big difference here is the skills that they are taking with them aren't being replaced. Many of the baby boomers have what we look at as the STEM skills, the science, technology, engineering, and math skills. And then many of them also have vocational skills such as construction and manufacturing, mechanical engineering. That's causing issues because those jobs are not being filled by that next group coming in, which is the millennials. Right now, the millennials uh, are approaching 50% of the workforce. They probably will get to being the largest workforce ever at about 81 million in about 2036, but they're replacing the workforce in numbers but not in skill sets. The, basically, the millennials are in the fields such as health, business, media, some science and technology but not in the numbers that can replace what's coming out in terms of the baby boomers. So if you look and say the baby boomers are entirely out of the labor force by 2023, that's about 45 million people that will be dropped out by then. And according to that number, that means I have to retire by 2023. So the other part is contributors to a tight labor market, the visa elimination, the H-1B visa it isn't that it's being eliminated, but what's happening is the fast track process for it is being uh, taken out and a lot more scrutiny on the whole program itself. So really what that means is you've got about currently about 650,000 to 850,000 or 800,000 jobs that are under these H-1B visas. These are three-year visas that are extendable to six years. They're meant to supplement for skill shortages, primarily in high tech. And if you take a look at them, they are primarily high tech roles. Not all of them are 
are necessarily jobs that cannot be filled here in the U.S., but a large amount of those are. So this now contributes, if I can't get H-1Bs and I can't get them on quickly, I now have to look for those skills somewhere else. So full-time work isn't really what it used to be. This is an interesting slide, an interesting statistic. Only about 27% of the world is working with a traditional full-time employment contract. And that's, that's interesting because if you look at the U.S., about 33% or 54 million workers are currently doing some type of independent work. That number is growing, and that's going to be more than almost 50% in the next five years. Think of that. Half of the U.S. population is working in some type of independent or less than full-time employment contract. Over worldwide, that number is continuing to grow. European Union is growing the fastest, and but currently India has about 40% of the world's independent jobs that they are doing. All of that, again, goes into that, what we talked about, especially with the millennials, in that the jobs that they prefer tend not to be the traditional full-time jobs. So if you look forward and look ahead and say, okay, millennials like this kind of work, I may need to take a look at how do I do this kind of work. If I look at staffing and sourcing over the years, it's really the process has been changing. Uh, this continues to evolve. Currently, back in the 1980s, recruiting was it, ultimately moving to VMS. VMS really coming of, of uh, going at full swing more around the 2000 area, but early ones introduced back in the 1990s. So you had the recruiting and VMS as being the two main sourcing options for full-time and for contingent labor. What you've seen happening over mid-2000s to currently is all sorts of different types of sourcing options being uh, introduced into the market. Those early staffing models and recruiting models, very siloed within companies. Primarily, if I'm an IT organization, I might be going through a VMS or directly to suppliers, looking for contingent pools, not connected to the HR side of the house, which was looking for full-time people, probably through some type of ATS. Now today, you have the multiple sourcing options. And these multiple sourcing options are available in a lot of different ways to an enterprise. And it really becomes a question of how do they, how do they fit into the whole ecosystem for that particular company. So this is really going to be talking about all these different options and how you might work them into your own ecosystem. If you look at the whole contingent worker field, it's becoming much more complex. Initially, contingent workers were looked at as, these are hourly workers, I bring them in, I pay them, they go, they go home. It's typical coming through a supplier, a staffing supplier. Today, you have a lot of different types of contingent workers, freelancers, which are self-employed, uh, and these can be working with multiple clients. You also have a really big option now that's uh, growing quickly is super temps. And these are positions that in the past never would have been looked at as possibly even being a contingent position. These are large, high level managers, professionals, these are lawyers, CFOs, uh, they've even brought in CEOs, and these are contingent or temporary uh, positions. And they're increasing out there. There's companies specializing in finding these for companies. The changes that make this, make these changes in the contingent world happen is really because technology is, makes it a lot easier to plug in. I can be anywhere and work in these type of positions. Um, the job security is no longer a given. So as we said, when we take a look at the millennials out there, they're not necessarily looking at a full-time job. They're looking and saying, I'm probably going to have a lot of jobs and I'll work when I want to work. Uh, because there's no job security for me anyway if I had a full-time job. The job and life balance, much more important to these newer workers. So I want to be able to work when I want to work. I want to be able to take some time and, and apply it to my life too. And then companies are more open to these non-traditional approaches right now because they find that in order to find the right talent, I've got to look out there and I've got to allow for the different types of workers that are there.
So, when John, you do you see this as a, as a pendulum that might swing back the other way? So, you know, people want quality of life. People, you know, if you go back one slide, they want all the things that you're talking about there. But what if what if the company starts providing these type of things? You know, they're yep. giving better job security. They're giving better job life balance. Do you think the pendulum might swing the other way? You know, it's a great question, and, and I do believe that um, you will see some of this flattening out, and as you would with any type of phenomenon that comes along and everything. It's going to find its own balance point. And I believe, just as you mentioned there, because companies are now open to some of this non-traditional approach, and they can bring it inside and say, I, I can offer job balance, I can do a lot of things different than a traditional company, you might, mm -hmm. you might see that swing back inside like that. Um, I don't believe that I, the trend for going towards super temps, uh, that's not going to go away. I think companies have also looked and said, you know, I don't need to hire some of these positions on a high level management for uh, forever. I just need somebody to come in for a little while and do a job for me. Uh, so I think that's, mm -hmm. that's something that will continue. Interesting. All right. Thank you. Sure, and staffing suppliers themselves, in the past, as I said, very direct, uh, primarily companies had a relationship for the few of these companies. They offered them uh, contingent skills. What we've seen over the years is these companies, although they were generalists in the beginning, many more of these staffing companies are becoming specialists. Uh, maybe they're IT, maybe it's in the creative areas, such as uh, graphic designers or marketing people finance, administrative, a lot more split into the women and minority-owned small and disadvantaged companies. You've got local, regional, national, international, and then you've got people that offer specific services. So I can go out to a staffing company just because they offer payrolling, for example, so that if I find and source my own temporary labor, I can push them through that company to allow them to go to work. So the, quite, the thing here is that when you're looking at the companies that you're dealing with, you got to step back and say, for my own sourcing ecosystem, what do I need? Is it really about location? Is it about the type of skills that they're giving, giving me? Do I need specific services out there? On the recruiting side, recruiting has really become a specialized business. Uh, back you know, in the early recruiting, everybody had their in-house recruiters working inside the company. And what's happening now is you've got a lot of different ways to recruit for your organization. You could have in-house recruiters, but you can also have contingency recruiters. And these are recruiters that can either work for you on a contingent basis, uh, where I'll pay you when you find somebody for me, or I can go out and bring in a contingent recruiter that will work instead of me hiring somebody full time. You've got specific recruiters for executive or retained searches. Uh, recruitment process outsourcing has grown tremendously. It's bigger now. It's really when a company decides, I'm going to outsource the whole business process that's associated with recruiting to another company, and I'll let them run that. You can also do that on demand, which means I can determine what, what services or what uh, that I need from an RPO and use them on demand and pay for that as I need to. A lot of the recruiting today has become much more uh, social and, 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 and social media and business networking oriented. Uh, a lot of the people we find are through referrals. Uh, so the, as you take a look at how, my, how your sourcing ecosystem needs to be, you also need to say, who do I need to run this internally or who do I need to drive certain things? Do I need full-time? Recruiters, do I need contingency rec recruiters? Do I even take my whole process outside? Online staffing is really uh, allowing staffing companies much more than just being online on a website. This is really uh, allowing you as a customer to go and post your requirements, allows you to, uh, as a uh, contractor, looking for work to go in and post your resume along with your profile. Now you can get matched for resources there. Um, you can basically get uh, searches done on there. 
the online staffing company can act as a W-2 employer. So there's, and there's a lot of variations out there. So you want to take a look and say, uh, some companies are specializing in project-based work. Somebody are a bid-based work. So I might actually put uh, my profile out as an individual and bid on certain work that has been posted out there. And some of it's recruiter assisted uh, for the more specific roles. And you can hire direct from there. You want to take a look at online staffing very specifically. I've given, there's a couple uh, of these on the bottom here. So this is staff.com and Elance and uh, Odesk and things like that. Those have been around for uh, quite a while. They're all different in how they work. So if you're looking at online staffing as part of your ecosystem, you need to take a look at them specifically for what their services are and what you need. Statement of work is another option out there for sourcing that a lot of people don't look at today. Um, it's, it's been used in the contingent side of the business for a long time. In fact, uh, statement of work or services procurement has often been a place where contingent labor is being hidden uh, because somebody would, would push that through there. But however, if you're having difficulty sourcing for certain types of work or skills, you can look for companies out there that do this as part of project work, and that's a perfect spot to bring that in. And many of these people are probably going to be independent contractors, and that's fine. Uh, statement of work, uh, putting them on, under a statement of work is a perfect way to do that. So you can run these as projects. They could be projects with, you know, milestones or just I just need to, I, I'll give it time and material, and that's fine too. But it is a valid option for looking for other ways that you can find talent for companies that provide that through only through project work. So, John, sure. can I just interject with a question that came in? And it's this, this is a little subjective, but as you're seeing and you're working with people that want to be independent, is a master's as valuable, you know, a master's degree as valuable as it once was? Or is job experience or diversity of your job experience more important? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and, and interestingly, with the ICs, with the independent contractors, it's much more the work that's more important and the actual ability to show that I did this work. And in fact, I'll talk about that in, a, in just a little bit, but some of the sourcing options you have out there for independent contractors allow them not only to post what actual skills they have, but actually to post evaluations of work they've done for other customers in that area. And that's what counts with people that are looking for those skills, um, not so much the degree. Yeah, especially the further and older you get away from your degree. It seems like it, it probably diminishes and the work speaks for itself. Yep, it's more the uh, can you show me that you did this somewhere else, you know, and did it successfully. Yep. Good, thank so, you. Yep. Specialty pools or talent pools, um, these can take any form, but generally you're going to see them within a recruiting application, like an applicant tracking system or a vendor management system. It's much more than just a resume database. Uh, it's really, ideally, it's known talent from your own full-time plus contingent labor grouping and allows you to get visibility into this. So what you might look at a special, creating a specialty pool for, let's say you are a utility company, you've got these baby boomers retiring and they've got many of the electrical engineering skills that you need that are currently not available out there for you to bring in through uh, traditional resource sources out there. So you might want to create a pool of your retired workers and then utilize them in either a part-time mode or you're actually bringing them in as, as consultants, independent contractors later on. Um, and this is a real option right now that is currently being used by a number of these companies out there because our, in our whole infrastructure, uh, especially within the whole utility industries, we're losing a lot of skills that are not being replaced. Uh, so many of these retired workers are being sourced to bring back in, not only for consulting, but actually in training for this next generation of people that are coming on board. Specialty pools are really about defining what kind of talent you utilize internally and determining where can I get known talent and, and build that in a pool so I can quickly go to that.
freelance management systems. Um, these are, you know, they're all cloud-based uh, that are out there right now, but it's really, this is for sourcing and managing independent contractors, and we were talking about that earlier. They're, these allow the contractors to get on and build their profiles, to list their particular uh, skills along with where they've worked, uh, if they've worked through the freelance management system in the past, it will contain their evaluation in information on there so you know how they did on a particular job. It may allow for verification of credentials, and by that I mean if independent contractors need to be verified that they truly are an independent contractor, they meet the government regula regulation, that's not necessarily all FMSs, all systems out there do that, so that's something you as the user need to make sure that uh, you're checking on. But it does give you this engagement and management platform that allows you to do everything from payments to evaluations. They've been out there a while, a couple examples on the bottom, different, probably different levels, work market very much focused on uh, independent contractors, project work. Guru has been a much more um, independent, I, I would say, I don't want to say lower level, but it's much more individual work uh, that's out there, but it's been around for quite a while. They're very different systems, so the point being if you need to use freelancers, independent contractors, you can take a look at the systems that are out there today um, and, and determine which ones work for you. So can, I'm sorry, can you explain a little bit better for me, and then I don't mean to sound dense, but what is the true difference between online staffing and freelance management? Isn't it still, the, isn't it the same? Because it's all cloud-based, it's online? Interesting, but uh, it's a great question. The biggest difference is the type of employee. So the employees that you're gonna see come through an online staffing application they're probably going to end up being a W-2 employee that the online staffing company will underwrite and, and be their W-2 employer. The freelancers are independent contractors, 1099 employees, and as such, they have to be uh, verified as, in fact, that they truly meet those uh, those arrangements there. So it's a different type of uh, tax relationship. It's also a different relationship with the company itself. Okay, that so helps. then if you have somebody, it, it helps, but then what about the other ones that you mentioned earlier that you can go to, um, you know, the Odesk and, you know, Elance and stuff like that? Aren't they, are they a mix of both or are they also freelance? They can be a mix of both. And that's why I said you have to take a look at the, many of these individually to see exactly how they offer their services, but they tend to be, primarily more W-2 employee oriented. So the types of people okay. that you would find on there, you may hire directly or, or the company may sponsor them as a W-2 employee. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Yep. Now crowdsourcing. Um, crowdsourcing has actually been around for quite a while. Uh, you, you're probably aware and they've got on there the GoFundMe model which just says I need funds for something, I've got a great idea, um, and, and I'm going to push it out there to a lot of people, and if everybody gives, every, a lot of people give me a little money, it'll fund my entire operation. That's basically the model that is used for crowdsourcing when you're talking about it in terms of a project work. Uh, the SETI Institute, actually been around since the 1980s, um, they've been searching for aliens since the 1980s. It's, it's, and their piece has been the same there. Is they take a lot of data and they send it out to millions of people and millions of people work on very small pieces of that data and send it back to them. Uh, but it's still, it's the same type of project work that you would find in crowdsourcing. So if you have a very large project that is made up of very small, discrete tasks, you can distribute this to on-demand workers and they can tackle this. And this doesn't need to be just technical. You could have a large internal uh, creative project or marketing project, something like that. And there are companies, I put down there on the bottom, Amazon Mechanical Turk, that actually is a, is a platform that specializes in doing these type of projects. And the interesting thing about that is that 
they actually specialize in jobs that computers can't do, that humans must do. Um, but there are a few out there crowdsourcing platforms that allow you to do very large projects like this on, on that scale. And, um, and if, I guess I would say here it's got to be very specific in terms of your project must be very large and it must be able to be broken into small tasks. And then you can post it out there and people will generally bid on it and say, I can do these tasks for you. Um, and you might actually find that you know, in a lot of uh, companies that use a lot of content, uh, editorial content and things like that. Those kind of things get thrown out there all the time as I need somebody to write little blog articles for me, but on a giant scale. Finally, the custom recruiting. Uh, custom recruiting really is where somebody is going to find specific roles for your company. And, and there's some companies out there now that really take a scientific approach to identifying what your company needs. So they get with you on a consultative basis and determine what it is that you need, not only from skills that you need for positions, but also what's your company culture. Because when they go out and they look for people, they are looking to make sure these are people that not only have the skills to do the work you want, but would like working in the, in the culture that you have. These are not resume-based types of approaches. These are really testing and work samples. I mean, where they actually will, will bring people in and say, show me that you can do this type of work. And they'll have a sample for them. And it could be, um, you know, show me that you, you can write a PR release for me or whatever it happens to be. They do videos of the people working. What they've gotten out of this is higher retention and higher employee, employee employer satisfaction. So if you look at the types of work that many of these custom recruiting uh, jobs are, some of them is call center. Call center has a notorious, really uh, poor retention rate and a turnover. So you, more than 50% of call center jobs turn over consistently. So what they do in this is find people, number one, that like to work in call centers, and number two, that have those skills to do what they need to do. They've actually achieved retention rates within call centers that are well over 80%, and, and that's pretty high. Uh, company on the bottom that I mentioned there, uh, Higher Art, that's one that does this kind of specific custom recruiting. Uh, you can find others out there, uh, but if you've got jobs, say sales jobs that you have to hire for in volume, that's the kind of company to go to uh, that you can push out and they can find the types of skills that you, you need. So as I said, you've got multiple sourcing options here. It's online staffing, um, the SOW contingent pools that you can create, freelance management systems, all sorts of different things, but you can't have them all. You need to basically determine what is your sourcing ecosystem made up of? So you might look and say, I, in my particular system, I've got a VMS as a central aggregator here. I've got recruiting. I've got staffing suppliers that I deal with. Maybe I'm going to bring in this, this freelance management system because I have an opportunity to truly use freelancers and then also a workforce visual, visualization tool that I can see the entire thing. On the left-hand side there, what you see is generally third-party plugins to the ecosystem. There's all sorts of companies out there offering these types of things. So if I say I'm going to use a, a freelance management system, perhaps I need a company that does independent contractor vetting for me. And they get plenty of those companies that offer that kind of thing. Or if I'm going to utilize this as my whole sourcing ecosystem, I need analytics that allow me to say, how are we doing? What's it look like across the entire spectrum of what I have? Or maybe I need compensation data. So I know if I'm recruiting for something full time, or even if I'm doing something through the VMS, am I getting the best uh, rates that I need? Scheduling for certain types of groups, such as healthcare, very important that I be able to, to mix and match those requisitions I have through the proper scheduling tool that I have too. So all of those things are plug-in type of things that you might fit into your system, and it depends, again, on what your particular needs are. 
So if I looked at a workforce visualization tool, for example, this is going to be something that allow me to see between my contingent data and my full-time employee data. I want to see that at once. Traditionally, this kind of stuff has been very siloed within organizations. Now you've got opportunity out there to say, I need to see my whole workforce. It's really a total talent approach that I need to be able to go out and say, I want to see the workforce and I want to see it based on skills. I don't care if it's full time. I don't care if it's a contingent uh, person working out there. Or I want to see it based on availability uh, or based on cost or performance or any one of those things. Those options are out there. This allows you to then take a look at those types of data points and say, okay, now I've got now I've got things that I can look at and make decisions on across the entire uh, the entire workforce. You can also look and say, I want to really integrate between what would can traditionally is the recruiting side of the house for full time and the contingent side of the house for uh, my contract labor. I want to be able to say, I don't care if my requisition, when I put it in there, I want it to go to both of those resources out there because I want them to take a look across the entire enterprise across many different things and say, I don't care if you source it as contingent or actually full time. Create and basically create a labor pool built up of both of those. This does give you a chance to uh, really hire or, or contract or contract to hire as you go through there. And then finally, the best of both worlds really, when you're looking at your reporting options across your sourcing ecosystem, it really shouldn't be confined to, I just have one report for this application, I have one report for this other application. The reporting should be able to go across the enterprise. So, for example, if I wanted to take a look and say, here's my contract labor that I currently have working, here's when it's coming available, yet also over here, here's the open requisitions I have within the company, I want to match those two together. I want to put this in one actual view, one re report, and be able to make strategic decisions on this based on what I currently have working. There's no need for me to resource something that is currently out there working for me as a resource today. So I've got, I know what, how they're doing, I know where they are, I know when they're available, and I know that I have other needs within the company. So when I have a requisition, I can send it out to my sourcing eco ecosystem, and that's basically going to say I'll take a look across the entire um, the entire enterprise here and see what you have available. So you're saying so in this ecosystem, it would go out to multiple different companies that you work with in your ecosystem to get a scan of the available talent that might be coming due. Yeah, absolutely, and setting it up correctly. Uh, allowing for the integration between the what has traditionally been very siloed type operations, the full time versus the contingent side, means when I have a requisition, when I have something out there, I can source it across my entire group. So even if I pulled in, say, another operation such as uh, freelance management, along with mm -hmm. looking at my regular contingent staffing, looking at my regular recruiting, maybe the role should be going out to a freelance side, I can still utilize the same system to do that. I still have a view of all of my, my talent that I need versus all of the talent that I actually have. And then I, uh, once I've actually filled that position, I get a view of here's all the people that I have working. doesn't matter where I got them. Uh, it's, it's that I have them working. I know when they're available. I know where they are. Uh, so yes, that's what it is really is. Uh, your sourcing ecosystem should be able to discern what type of position you need and send it out to the right groups. Interesting. So does it also keep track of the fact that that person has worked here before or, you know, they, we have to have them gone for a year based on our own internal rules about independent contractors? Does, do, can we build any of that kind of rule-based system into this? You know, you can. It's interesting. The um, 
the decisions we used to make years ago regarding uh, things such as how long somebody can be in an, in an account and how, how long they need before they come back, much of that has gone away based on IRS changes and rules, but you can still build whatever, whatever rules that you have into the system to say, you know, I want to take a look at resources that have worked at, for me in the past, but I also want to do it based on an evaluation number too. Um, I want mm -hmm. anybody that's been evaluated at a certain level to be in my, in my talent pool. I, others I don't want in my talent pool. Uh, so it's, may, it's really determining what gets into your talent pool. And part of that could be based on tenure uh, arrangements that you have in the company. Part of it could be based on the evaluation scores. Um, a lot of different reasons uh, and certain skill sets uh, that you want in there. And then also you want to make sure that that talent pool remains fresh. So pretty much what you're looking for is if I put people in the talent pool and they sit there for longer than a certain period and they're not being utilized, I'm going to push them, pull them out of the talent pool too. I want to make sure that the uh -huh. talent pool is always, is always fresh and up to date. Uh -huh. Right. So it really is about um, making those decisions as, as to what you want and centralizing that in terms of uh, being able to aggregate the things such as data that you have on the actual requisitions, data that you have on the actual workers, and being able to visualize that also so that you can make those kind of strategic decisions across your entire enterprise. I think the biggest part that I see uh, with some of these changes out there as people move towards this total talent approach is really just destroying the silos that, that people have been working in. And I think it does, um, it, it's a tremendous step for the whole enterprise to do that because recruiting and contingent labor have long been in these individual silos, yet they share so much and so much information mm -hmm. across there that it, it absolutely makes sense to open that up and determine that. And then also to, when I look at requirements for a company, it shouldn't be down at the individual uh, business unit level. It should be across the enterprise. And that's where I begin to make strategic decisions for the company and say, you know, if I look at your past, you've over the over this year you generally use this kind of these kind of people at this level. And now I've got some things to make decisions about how does my sourcing eco ecosystem need to, to look going forward? You know, what, what makes sense? So, John, although I, I, I have never done this before, I'm, I'm going to ask a, a pointed question. Where does people fluent play in this space? Who are you in all these bubbles? Uh, Primarily, I mean, we're a talent acquisition, talent management company, but I really speak from a the vendor management side of the business. Uh, so as an aggregator, I mean, in terms of we, we act as the centralized unit for some companies in terms of, yes, they have our BMS, but they also have relationship with an online staffing company or they also have a, a recruiting option and it might be our option we have, we offer recruiting or it might be a third party uh -huh. recruiting so okay know, so, we, so if i put people fluent in the center you could actually you are the the, the true hcm you know human capital management component that can pull all this together is that true it's true uh we have the ability to uh to interface and integrate with uh those items that allow you to see a view of your total talent that you have, specifically the recruiting aspect along with the BMS and the, and the reporting across multiple applications. So when we look at reporting, it isn't just in a BMS arena, but it's also in the RMS side, the recruiting side of the house, and doing those all together. Uh, so we have that. Many of the other things are third parties that plug into our various options. Uh, but we certainly have the ability to integrate across the, the larger ones. Thank you. And, then, and the only reason I'm, I'm, I asked the question is you, you did such a great job at being non-commercial that I started to lose, <laughs> like, okay, where, which one are they? I actually jumped out to your website to say, but they could do this bubble, this bubble, I think this bubble. 
So thank yeah. you. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I mean, um, a lot of these options that I show on here are definitely third parties, uh, different companies, that, things that we don't offer, uh, but are needed within a within an ecosystem. So I don't think you can be totally commercial about it and go and say we're the only solution here. I think um, there's nobody out there today that can say that. I think we certainly have a a step up on the total talent aspect of this and the ability to integrate, but that still requires other companies uh, to go in there and, and to be open to integrating with some a customer's other solutions that they have. So that's why the ecosystem varies from company to company. Yeah, interesting. So I have another question that, that since we have this slide up and we have crowdsourcing showing, and it says with crowdsourcing, what method are companies using to bring on these workers? Is it a 1099 direct basis, or are they routing them through a previously identified payroll vendor? Generally, uh, they're using a 1099 type approach because it's individuals that are basically bidding on small tasks, and and so they're they're all independents really. Uh, they're using platforms to do that. Uh, you can do that through uh, an FMS such as Work Market. Um, as long as you know you you can actually go out to something like work market and say here's the talent pool i want to create just for this big job here and they will aggregate all those people with those particular skills and then you post your requisition those people all either bid on it or accept it and they can utilize that platform to actually uh, do the payments through it okay but then you can have people bidding on projects that are not within your country and so they don't have a social security number to issue a 1099. So how do you, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought, I thought the bids could come in from anywhere in the world. Yeah, but you actually have a control over where am I going to allow this to be bid on. Uh, so both of those, uh, Work Market and Guru, the two that I mentioned, uh, you can specifically go in and say U.S. only, uh, especially if that's something that you, you want to control that way. Um, mm -hmm. So you've got options there. There are also um, there's some safety measures in there too that allow you to escrow your payment money so that you're not paying out until you, people actually finish and you sign off on work. And, mm -hmm. and the escrow and the escrow protects them too because if they work on something and um, and you sign off on that, then that says that money's it's going to be they're going to be paid. So. And then another question came in. They said, can you place a regular hourly contingent worker in a statement of work system? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are companies that employ groups of W-2 workers, and they are just going to, let's say, if you've got something, a uh, project you want done, it could be even a single, it could be even a single individual that's going to do it but you're going to contract with that company, that individual is still a W-2 employee of that company. So your SOW is, is, contraction, uh, is contracting with the company that you're working through. does not always have to be an independent contractor. In fact, many of those oh, companies oh. that offer project work are going to be, uh, basically have a W-2 staff. Okay. And then another question that says, how do the specialty pools work? Specialty pools are going to be set up based on your particular needs. So let's say I'm interested in when I have a, a requirement, since people that work in my company generally have the same type of skills, I, I want to look not only at outside and, and, and into the normal sourcing for, say, a full-time employee, but I also want to look at current contractors that are working, the known talent that's working, and I want to see who's coming available that has the kind of skills I want. So before I actually go out and source this, let me look and see if I've already got that sort that skill in house. That could also be based on my full time people too. So what you're then doing is saying, I want to pull people from two different groups and put them into a, a single area that is searchable based on these particular skills. So my my known talent. Uh, is going to be groups that I can look at and say they've worked here in the past. I can look at their particular skills and I can see what their availability is. Now, if 
how you work it is if you're talking about it through a recruiting function, generally within the recruiting function, they have that ability to store and create that. Uh, if you're talking about it within an FMS, a freelance management system, they have the ability to build talent pools specifically for your company uh, based on the skill sets and, the, and, and whatever else you define for that. So it's going to vary based on what's in your sourcing ecosystem and what you need. Uh, generally, you need maybe a VMS and an RMS uh, or an RMS to create that. And folks, just keep your questions coming. Like I said, if we don't get to them today, we will follow up with you. I, not we, John will follow up with you after. So the other question is, are there liabilities to using an independent contractor? And what I'd like to do is build on that. You said that it's getting, the IRS rules are changing, but then we also have state compliance issues that could vary state by state, correct? True. Um, the IRS rules have changed in the last several years now that um, what the things that they used to talk about defining what an independent contractor uh, must or must, mustn't have is now down to really about three different things. One of those is who has financial control over this individual. So if they took a look at the independent contractor and you were their only employer over the last two years, if it truly was not an independent that showed that I have multiple people I've worked for, that's, that's a strike against there. Uh, the mm -hmm. other one is who has control of that individual's work. Um, if you require that individual to show up from 8 to 5 every day and, and, and do specific things as you would a regular employee, that doesn't, that doesn't work well either uh, for them. So a lot of what they're looking at now is, is really about much less about all of the financial dynamics behind, you know, am I an independent contractor registered with this and that. It's much more about how am I being utilized and, and is my job really independent? Do I get this, my financial um, support from at least more than one customer out there? So is there liabilities to using them? Going back to your first part of your question there, yes, uh, still. There are, there are states specifically that are continue to go after what they'd say is uh, misclassified independent contractors. Uh, Connecticut's been very tough on that because they found they could make a lot of money doing it. Um, but the federal government itself has backed off on their program uh, that they had probably started about six years ago, and they're not they're not as gung-ho about going after them as they used to be. But still, there are liabilities, and they're big liabilities if you truly are misclassifying a large number of people that could be out there. So they're going to come after you not only for the taxes that should have been paid, but they're going to come after you with fines, and they're also going to go back. If they find one, they're going to go back six years within your company and look and audit oh. for all of them. These can be big, big dollar items. I mean, we're talking, you know, five to fifty million dollar fines. So, yeah, you don't want to make the news with one of those. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, is there another question? Is there liability insurance coverage that an IC carries that we need to make sure they have to reduce that liability? Yeah, I mean, there's standard coverage that uh, they would have, just as any company would have. I mean, if you look at them. Uh, an independent contractor is essentially a self-employed person, very often in an LLC. And so if you're doing business with companies, you're generally requiring them to carry some level of liability insurance. And, and doing business with an IC should be no different. Uh, they, they'll carry some level of insurance too. So if you're, if you're the one that's going through the vetting process for an independent contractor, the things you're looking for are are you, you know, can you show me that you in fact, in fact are a 1099, that you're in fact maybe an LLC, that you've got that, uh, you'd want to see, do you have this insurance? These are all the types of things. That kind of business of IC vetting is usually better left to a third-party company that specializes in it because it's an mm -hmm. interesting, it's an interesting uh, 
uh, thing that's happened is I've and I've seen this in the past where companies have said, okay, we took a look at we think these are the these people are good, and we're going to use them. And then we send them through a third party IC vetting company. They come back and say, no, they're not. <laughs> they don't meet the requirements. Ah. So interesting. So, folks, what I want to do is, is we don't have any other questions in queue, but I also lied. On John's last slide, they have all their social connect, but not John's connection information. So, if you want to open up your chat box right now, we will email it to you as well. But if you have an urgent question, this is all the social ways that you can connect. But in your chat, it will be john.more, M-O-O-R-E, at peoplefluence, all one word, dot com. And we yep. will send that out in the email to you tomorrow as well. But just in case you have a burning question today and you want to know how to reach him, that's his contact information. So, John, do you have any closing remarks? And, oh, excuse me, before closing remarks, now we are going to push the slide deck. So if you're still online, push. When we put the slide deck in the picture, click on it. It should download it directly to your hard drive. We also sent it out at the 10-minute mark before the webinar, but sometimes that gets caught in your junk file. So this way you can do a direct download, and we'll also send a link to it again tomorrow. So, John, as always, you bring fantastic information. I love the fact that you're so grounded and so knowledgeable that questions can come at you from all different directions and you never get flustered. I love that. <laughs> no, I enjoy doing these. I really do. I think it's a good, a good opportunity to, you know, share what I've learned over 30 years in this business and uh, enjoy the interaction. So hopefully it was helpful to people and I will be available for questions. You know what, John? I have to share one last comment that just came in. Commentary from an attendee. This was the best big webinar that I've attended. It was so helpful. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so, yeah, so thank you to whoever sent that in, but I, I just saw that. So thank you. So, John, thank you. Thank people, Fluent. Um, folks, remember the recording will be available for download and replay, share within your organization, download the slides, and keep the conversation going. John, most likely, will be in Carlsbad, right, right, John? I will. At our next, okay. So, that's, therefore, you all need to be in Carlsbad with us so you can have a conversation face-to-face -face with them as well. So, thank you, John. Have a great day, and thank you to People Fluent and to all of our attendees. Thanks for having a great webinar with us today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye, John. Bye, everybody.